If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. The term genetically modified organism can sometimes feel like it's loaded with connotations. Some people are totally okay with using modern scientific tools to make targeted improvements to organisms, while others prefer to let nature take its own course. It's a matter of preference, but it's created a lot of challenges in the brewing industry, namely regulatory challenges, but also in how breweries are talking to consumers about the ingredients that they use in beer. I'm your host, Kay Job, and today I'm back in the lab with my co-host, Jordan Folks, as we apply the science from last week's episode defining gmo jordan welcome back to the lab feels like we're in the 2000s or something i thought we've already had this debate (laughs) right i mean it seems like it just keeps going but again you know the the debate is part of it but then you know also sort of like some of the purpose of last week's episode was just to like help demystify uh genetically engineered and genetically modified organisms right yeah, and they did a really good job. And um, I've always been fascinated by this. It's like, wait, we can use computers to like modify actual living species. This is wild stuff. Oh, man. Is that the next application for chat GPT is like chat GPT suggests targeted modifications to genomes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, oh, man. later we'll have to talk about what we would type in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we how do we set that prompt? Um, anyway, yeah. So last week's episode, the whole purpose again with, uh, of course, Molly Browning and Avi Shevitz from Lalamond and Laura Burns from Omega Yeast was to help demystify this whole genetically engineered, genetically modified organism, and also to really you know have some real discussions about how new yeast strains are developed and where that line is. Right, it all happens in a lab somewhere, but where's the line? What counts as GMO? When does it become a regulatory issue? And also, when is there just that kind of an ethical issue to say, hey, yeah, this ingredient that's in your beer um, came from, you know, a genetic engineering? Where does something go? At what point does something go from natural or naturally occurring to artificial or modified? And are those changes good, bad, or just different? And those are the kinds of questions that we pondered last week and that Jordan and I are going to give our thoughts on this week as well. But first, if you're not already a patron of Brewlosophy, please consider becoming one. We really appreciate the support we get from our patrons, and as a reward for your support, you get awesome rewards to access like unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. Becoming a patron is easy. There's no obligation. You can cancel at any time. But if you're out there listening to this show and the Brulosophy podcast, and watching the Brulosophy show, and reading the experiments, Short and Shoddy, Hop Chronicles, Brew It Yourself, and everything else over at Brulosophy.com. Please show us your support by becoming a patron. Just visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And here's a shameless plug for the Brewlosophy show on YouTube. I was the guest on last week's Brewlosophy show episode where Martin interviewed me about the three most surprising things I've learned in the Brew Lab. And there's been so much that surprised me, but really those three most surprising things from the episode are no 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 i'm not gonna tell you you gotta go watch it over at youtube.com slash at the brulosophy show and this week's feedback of course is brought to you by the dedicated crew at haas who bred sabro from a neo-mexicanus subspecies growing wild in the mountains of new mexico think you know sabro think again this monster of a hop is efficient when it comes to delivering big flavor use less green to save more green if you know what i mean and if you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain try it in the whirlpool it's fun it's full of aroma and chemical compounds that last from the hot side to the final glass even if you dry hop on top of it sabro's known for its incredible blend of coconut tropical and stone fruits with a pronounced cream character with flavors of vanilla cedar dill and even mint can't decide where to use it no sweat sabro's available in haas in all haas hop formats to meet your brewing needs from highly consistent lupamax pellets to efficient incognito and traditional t90 pellets learn more about this awesome variety as well as the other innovative products haas has to offer at john that's john the letter i I-H-A-A-S dot com. 
All right, listener Simon says, Hi, Kate. I found your recent episode of the Brewlosophy show very intriguing. It's crazy to think that we can use lower gravity starters to improve the quality of our yeast pitches. It's something I'm excited to try in my brews. Question, do you know how these conditions might affect non-traditional yeast species like Britannomyces or some of the non-traditional non-alcoholic yeast species or maybe even lacto? Uh, Thanks as always for everything you do, Simon. What do you think, Jordan? This is an awesome question, and I would not be surprised if there's no research to answer this, Um, but I think that this is a really good point because we know that Britannomyces, for example, does not behave like Saccharomyces. And for that matter, there's probably, you know, differentiation between various sac strains either way. But um, for example, Britannomyces, uh, they say, takes longer in a starter to build up um, cell mass, as well as is good at fermenting very small amounts of wort, I'm sorry, sugars. And that's why we tend to uh, not need too much when pitching in secondary. There's only a little bit of, you know, a few gravity points left. And it's that slow consumption that Brett does over, you know, several months is what creates those nuanced Brett flavors that we uh, love and enjoy. And so I'm really intrigued by this in Brett, especially because we already know that it can handle low sugar concentrations well, but in terms of yeast or Brett propagation? I don't know. In terms of the other ones, like non-traditional, non-alk yeast, I don't even use those, so I have no clue. Really interesting (laughs) question. Right. Yeah, and the same thing with lacto too, right? I mean, you know, lacto, same thing. Like, lacto is going to last for a long time, just like Britannomyces. And that's kind of an interesting thing, too. I love the Britannomyces aspect of this and the non traditional yeast aspect um, because you're right. I mean, there are different mechanisms for how Britannomyces survives, right? It, like, Saccharomyces dies after a, a little while and it goes away. We, it, it kind of kills itself, right? But Britannomyces just hangs around and it hangs around for a long time. That's why you know as we age beers it gets uh, you know they get um older and older and they change in different ways because there's more brett character that's coming out so yeah but I, you know i totally uh, think that there might be some different conditions but at its heart britannomyces is still a yeast too so it's got those respiration and fermentation characteristics it, characteristics It can do both. I wonder uh, which one it prefers. Um, Great question. I wish I knew the answer, but this has inspired a new show on Britannomyces to talk about, you know, maybe some metabolistic characteristics of Britannomyces. What's actually going on during the fermentation as Britannomyces ages. So thanks, Simon, uh, for the question. All right. After this short break, Jordan and I will be back talking about genetic GEs and GMOs, genetically engineered and genetically modified organisms. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. In some situations, the terms genetically modified or genetically engineered have very specific definitions, such as the laws governing the use of genetically engineered ingredients or products in foods, especially in the United States and in Canada. Uh, But in other situations, it's vague and for some people just means made in a lab. (laughs) So, Jordan, I I thought we could start off kind of talking about our thoughts on uh, on GE GMO, genetically engineered and genetically modified organisms. Yeah, well, like I said at the very beginning in the intro is, I swear we had this debate in the 2000s, you know, when uh, GE, GMO, corn, etc. was getting a lot of press. 
And I think that there are compelling arguments on both sides. You know, like you said in the episode, um, it could theoretically help uh, farmer profitability or uh, improving the agronomic conditions or the yield or something like that. Um, and that's and, and I believe that the science hasn't really shown that it's turning us into Frankensteins or really genetically modifying <laughs> our bodies. But, uh, you know, on the flip side, it, this could be a problem maybe for crops. Um, you know, aren't there issues with certain crops, um, you know, having weird reactions to like the chemicals that are pumped by the same companies that are making the genetically modified, you know, organisms or uh, like you're not allowed to plant seeds that aren't GMO or something. There's some weird, you know, controversies surrounding like Monsanto, et cetera. And, you know, the uh, conspiracy theory, half of me kind of believes that there could be some legal or maybe biological problems with GMO, at least when it comes to plant crops. But when it comes to yeast, like the focus of the episode, I mean, that's not proliferating in the fields, right? And so I, I'm way less concerned um, with being very uneducated about the issue to begin with, but I'm way less concerned when it comes to yeast at the very least. Well, yeah, yeah. I, and I think well, it might have been in the episode that we talked about it. I can't, I can't remember for sure, but at least I was certainly having conversations with somebody about this too. But it's like, you know, the flowering so like corn and soy, um, if it's a GMO, you know, strain of that corn or soy, um, when it flowers and reproduces, that spreads, right? And it could spread mm -hmm. to a field that's not using GMO. So you've got, you know, this this kind of question about like, okay, we've got this, oh, you know, that's what it was. It was in my recent food safety class. That's where it was. It was not in the podcast episodes. It was in my food safety class where we were talking about GMO. And it's kind of saying like, hey, it's great that we've got this corn that increases, you know, production, but uh, that increases yield yields for farmers but if it spreads and there are you know farms and stuff that don't want to use gmo or they're trying to keep gmo out of their land and field um it, it spreads and may invade or take over because it's just hardier it's intended you know it, it does a better job and survives in those conditions and that was one of the questions i'm thinking about now with yeast right is like if we use gmo yeast is it, you know, going to contaminate, you know, strains or something? Is there like if you've got like a, a blind spot where you've got some some yeast that's sitting in there that's not fully getting clean, is that going to start doing things um, in your fermentation? But ultimately, kind of like you, Jordan, I'm kind of I was thinking back to this and it's like, man, it feels like we had like the G, the, you know, the GMO use or don't use debate back 10 or 15 years ago. But maybe this is something that's just going to keep uh, keep cropping up. I mean, in, in terms of like use and safety. Yeah, I mean, I love how Nick Harris explained this in episode 20 of the podcast. He was essentially like, hey, look, we don't make any changes to the yeast that we don't totally understand, right? Um, and, and I think he said it, and I think Avi said it in this one, and Laura said it as well in this episode. Yeast is the most studied microorganism on the planet, right? I, I mean, it's it's well understood. Uh, it's a very safe place for research. And I think that's where it kind of makes sense that we're kind of seeing this start in GMO. But I asked a question as well, too, in, uh, of, the, of my guests, you know, Molly, Avi, and Laura, like, what about barley and stuff? I mean, they even wrote it in their paper that barleys, that, that this might be something that barley breeders can use or hop breeders might be able to use this, uh, you know, these gene editing technologies to increase yield or change change hop character, you know, increase thiol consumption, any of this stuff. So I'm kind of excited about GMO. But like you said, I understand there's kind of, there's two sides to this. Some people want to stay natural and organic. And I understand that. And, you know, there's, you know, these things are new. I mean, I think most genetically modified organisms, even like corn and soy, were only discovered in the 90s, right? So we're talking about 30 years. And so even if you have studied these for 30 years, there's no way that we know the long-term impacts of, you know, consuming GMO or anything like that even though no no red flags raised as of now right i mean my whole thing is does it make a better crop and is it or a better product and is it safe right so um if there's a way to make you know super citra or something with gmo you know i'm intrigued yeah yeah for sure exactly I, i'm intrigued i'll probably brew with it <laughs> you know <laughs> um <laughs> but but yeah it, it, but again i i do think like there there is something to be said for like um you know the the organic side of this you know um i don't know if this is the right way to think about it but it's kind of like you know doing things the long way 
um, because you learn about that or because you understand more or because it's more fun is okay, right? So like doing things by like breeding or conventional methods and stuff, that's that's fun. Genetically engineering just makes it faster and sometimes that's okay. Oh, this is the example I was gonna, gonna talk about. It's like the cake mix, right? We have a cake mix now, which is genetically, which not genetically modified, I'm sorry, it's formulated, it's commercially formulated to make making a cake really easy. So all you have to do is you add some eggs, water, put the cake in the oven and you have a one wonderful cake. You don't have to worry about flour and protein content and all this other stuff, um, you know, that you would do if you were baking a cake. And I kind of think of GE GMO yeasts that way. If I want to improve the thiol character in my, in my beer, it's super easy to pitch a thiol um, expressing yeast, maybe with some phantasm powder, um, and we get a nice thiol bomb. And so that's kind of how I think about GE or GMO. But one of the questions I had, too, and this was kind of a big theme throughout the episode, Jordan, is when does something become a genetically engineered or genetically modified yeast, in your opinion? Huh. I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that, but um, I think that <laughs> you know when you start messing around with the genes, right? And um, they're saying genetically... I, I like this differentiation between genetically modified or genetically engineered because I think engineered um, explicitly states that humans are manipulating it, right? As opposed to um, GMO, I mean, couldn't organisms naturally modify themselves over the course of evolution or crossbreeding or hybridization or something? Yeah, yeah, and that's true. And maybe that's where we should start, right? Is like the methods for making yeast. Because we talked about this. We spent some time talking in the episode, like methods for ye making yeast. It was kind of in the latter half of the episode, but I do think it's a good place to start. There's what, what they referred to, what Avi and Laura and Molly referred to as conventional methods, and then the genetic engineering, right? Um, and so kinetic, or I'm sorry, conventional methods would be something like, yeah, putting, you know, uh, you know, using um, yeast's ability to sexually reproduce to create new yeast strains, right? Um, and that's what's happened. That's how all of these strains that we have now for brewing have happened over the years. There's, you know, e evolutionary pressure by pitching them into an anaerobic environment called beer that's got high sugar content, right? And there's going to have high ethanol content as you as um, fermentation continues, so we humans have influenced the path of yeast over the years, but we kind of think of this as like, oh, it's the conventional, it's the natural, natural way, but yeast, the changes to yeast, yeast is considered a domesticated species now, it's no, or at least brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae brewer's yeast is a domesticated species because we as humans have applied a huge amount of evolutionary pressure onto the yeast. And that's not something we discussed in the show, but that's an example of, hey, that's a conventional method, but humans were still at the heart of it. I mean, humans still did it, right? We, you know, it was wasn't like, um, you know, I mean, yeast exists in the wild, right? But all of the characteristics that we've come to value as brewers, like efficiently producing alcohol, you know, having the ester profiles and aromas that we want, um, all, you know, operating at temperatures that we are, you know, comfortable fermenting at, that's all natural stuff, but it has happened because of humans. So I like that. So are those genetically modified or are those genetically engineered? And then that's even before you get to like the more targeted stuff like today, like hybridization, like um, Imperial has been doing with the Imperialis and uh, like, um, uh, you know, the Nova Lager from uh, for, uh, from Lalamond that we were talking about with Avi, you know, and you start to get into these more weeds like yeast made in the lab and then not even talking about CRISPR and Cas9, right, where you're targetedly actually going in and manipulating a gene, uh, right? Yeah, I guess so. The, this selective pressure that you described, it's not really genetically modified. It's like genetically selected, right? We're like kind of forcing the hand of survival of the fittest in the brew house. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I mean, if you think about that, even over a short period of time, I and mean, think about the number of times you can repitch a yeast, you know, and, and, and grow it up. And let's say that, you know, you pitch a yeast, right? Um, yeah, and then on the fourth generation, you really like the beer that you brew. So you harvest some of that yeast. And that's the yeast that you grow up next time, right? And then on the fourth generation of that yeast, you decide to harvest that. You're now eight generations in from the parent strain of the yeast, and you might only be 48 hours away, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, depending on or maybe maybe a week or two. Right. In terms of time, we're not talking about like think about in humans in eight generations. Right. That's hundreds of years. Yeah. So you think about like evolutionary pressure and how fast you can modify um, um, a yeast genome. Not that the yeast genome would 
evolve that quickly. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that your yeast is going to evolve after four generations. In fact, that's very unlikely to happen. Uh, it takes a long time uh, for a yeast genome to actually like mutate um, and evolve because yeast aren't reproducing sexually in your beer. They're reproducing asexually. They're budding and making copies of themselves and then dying off. They're not re they're not like finding other species of yeast and, and creating hybrids in your beer. So I just want to be very clear about that. That's not happening. But then you have this really fast targeted CRISPR, right? And so that's the new technology. CRISPR Cas9, that's this targeted modification that Laura was talking about. Um, and it's actually going in and altering genes and you know there's all kinds of examples of how this happened but but um and we didn't talk about it on the episode but it was, i wish we should we we should have i should have asked this question um omega had this whole POF negative series for a while and i think they still do i just i remember it was really popular a couple of years ago um but i think they might still have it but the whole idea was you can make a yeast strain. So POF, right? POF is the phenolic off flavor. That's like in a Hefeweizen. It smells like clove and banana. But nobody really likes, or a lot of people don't like the clove flavor, especially if it's just clove and you're not getting any of the other esters. So they were able to go in and you could. they know which gene is responsible for POF, right? It's the phenolic off flavor gene, POF gene. They know what it is. So if you go in and change, uh, I can't remember the exact thing, if they take that gene out or if they add another gene that's presses it or whatever, but you can make a banana bomb. And I think they have a yeast called something like Bonanza, um, which is the GMO uh, with the, the clove and spicy phenolic. Um, and so it's like all isoamyl acetates, like a Hefeweizen with just banana um, and bubblegum and maybe no none of that clove flavor. But you've got all these like really, really cool things that you can do um, with those targeted modifications. Have you ever, did you ever hear, hear of this like POF negative stuff? Yeah, I did, but um, I have no interest in it because I love the POF. Um, it's yeah, like, what yeah, do you... You love you know, the clove, yeah. <laughs> I know, I want the clove, and so give me the opposite. You know, Take the uh, banana ester out. Which maybe they'd be able to do too, right? Um, I, I, and in fact, maybe they did. Maybe they did take the banana out. Maybe they made a pair there. I, oh. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think they might have made the pair, right? Like take the POF away in one and take the banana away in the other, and then you, it's like a very clear example of how you can do it. Yeah, that's cool because people are always trying to balance banana and clove in a half, right? And so you could then, if you had them isolated into two different strains, if like if you want more clove than banana, maybe seventy five percent pof positive yeast and twenty five percent pof negative. Yeah, or blend, right? You know, that's take what I meant. Your yeah. two beers. <laughs> oh, yeah, the yeah, blend, yeah. the yeah, beers, yeah. yeah, the finished beers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, blend the finished beers, and so yeah, then then you can control exactly how much banana and and phenolic you want, um, and just make it exactly what you want there, um, and then use the other ones for something else. I mean, who knows? You can make like a banana smoothie beer. I'm sure that um, if it hasn't been, I'm sure somebody has done that, right? Like you made a banana, and, and you would drink it. I know you would. <laughs> uh, if it, you gave it to me for free, I would definitely take a sip, but. Um uh, I, I don't know. I think there are certain fruits that don't belong in beer, and I would say banana is one of them. Says the guy that loves the the Hefeweizens, but that, well, <laughs> I, I mean, you're more of you're more of a lager guy. But, but anyway, but you know, actually, that makes an interesting point, right? Because um, the uh, the the S, the banana ester, what's it called again? Isoamyl acetate. Isoamyl acetate, right? And um, it, it's found in bananas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like one of the key. That I mean, it's the banana flavor. Yeah, right. So. Could what could they inject like the strawberry chemical or something like that via CRISPR so that we could like <laughs> access other fruits that we're not already finding naturally in brewers yeasts? Well, you know, I mean, that's a fantastic question, right? That would be really cool. Maybe that maybe we could have some yeast that oh, there's a fr like a fruited yeast series mm -hmm. where you don't have to add fruit, but it expresses like fruit character, like peach. Isn't that one that like so many people try to brew with and it's just so hard to get it to come through? Um, that's a really interesting idea, but that's almost exactly like what Berkeley yeast did with their terpenes product, right? With their original, um, their original, uh, genetic modification is they realize like, Hey, there's all these terpenes in other plants. And so they, uh, modified brewer's yeast to come to add in the terpene flavors that they want. And they can like, you know, targeted 
say like, okay, these are the genes that are responsible for this specific terpene, like linalool or geraniol or any of those things, myrcene, um, you know, uh, co- or, or I'm not, not cohumulone, humulene, um, yeah, uh, you know, any of those, uh, those terpenes that you're looking for, they can actually encode that into the yeast and just take like things from basil or oregano or other plants um, and put it in uh, to the yeast genome. And then it makes this terpene um, because yeast have a pathway that does that. And so maybe if you can find like a strawberry or a peach pathway, maybe there's a way to get uh, yeast to do that as well. But, you know, the interesting, the whole point of this like discussion about like the methods of making yeast and when does something become um, uh, a genetically modified organism. Um, and I have a good example for this. And it was one we didn't talk about on the show, but I'm interested uh, to, to see your opinions on it. It's Sour Vissier versus something like Philly Sour, right? Um, you know, are you familiar with those two yeast, Sour Vissier and Philly Sour? Uh, vaguely, but maybe you could give us a quick recap. Yeah. So sour vissier is a genetically modified yeast. Um, it's, it's a yeast that has been modified such that it produces lactic acid. So it's a yeast that you pitch during fermentation and it sours the beer and it ferments the beer at the same time. And it's a Saccharomyces strain that's been modified, right? Correct. Yeah. Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain. Yeah. And that's important, right? Because Philly sour is not a Saccharomyces strain. Philly sour was actually harvested from a, a graveyard. So yeah, if you remember, I had Matt Farber on the show. I think it was in maybe episode three or something like that. It was one of the early episodes of the brew lab, but in his gen- he was teaching a general micro class and they have to go out and figure out how to harvest, you know, microbes from, uh, you know, different surfaces. So one of the students went out and harvested a microbe from a tree um, and it turned out it looked like it had good brewing characteristics. So they brewed with it and it's Lachancia thermotolerance. Um, that's a Lachancia species. So Saccharomyces, or I'm sorry, Lachancia genera. Um, so Saccharomyces lachancia. Um, those are two different geno- genuses. Um, so it's a totally different genus of yeast. Um, and but it, that what that Lachancia thermotolerance does is when it's in the presence of oxygen, they think uh, it spits out a whole bunch of lactic acid, which goes on for about 24 hours in the beginning of a fermentation, and then it switches its metabolism to ethanol production. Um, so it's that whole respiration versus fermentation thing. Uh, but anyway, it, and then it produces alcohol in like the later later time periods. But so Philly sour is just a wild yeast. So there is a yeast that already exists. It's, you know, it's not a Saccharomyces, but it's a yeast family that exists out in the wild. So nature made a yeast that both produces lactic acid and ferments and makes alcohol. So sour vissier is the genetically modified version of this. And this is kind of where it's like where I get into like, okay, wow, Lachancia thermotolerans exists out in the world, but does that mean that the Philly sour, does that mean that that, that Lachancia thermotolerans is better than sour vissier or that somehow sour vissier is going to, you know, cause issues or or act any differently? Um, Or maybe if sour vissier had just happened in the wild, it would be called, you know, Lachancia thermotolerans, uh, you know, or, or some other species if it was found out in the wild. I think that's a cool example of like GMO versus like nature, natural product. And is one of them better or worse? No, they're just different. Right. And I think someone might say, well, then why are we even genetically modifying things? Why don't we just go out into nature and collect all these samples and then find the ones that are unique and novel. And you talk to any yeast wrangler like Jeff Mello at Bootleg Biology, and they'll tell you how many hundreds, thousands of trials they have to go through before they find something that's actually going to be, you know, something that a brewer is going to want to use. You know, these wild yeast strains that they're capturing in the wild, they might not ferment well. They might taste horrible. Um, They might not effectively reduce pH. I'm not an expert in these things, but uh, I gather that it's really challenging and so Philly Sour, you know, they struck gold when they found this thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you say you're not an expert in it, but you will be. Um, so thank you for teasing next week's episode. <laughs> so next week's episode is actually going to be an episode about foraging yeast, uh, you know, going out into uh, a forest and finding yeast, uh, which, of course, you know, and you're prepared for. Uh, you will be an expert after next week, Jordan. Uh, well, I promise. Uh, so, yeah, but but it is it takes a it's a big deal. It's really hard to find out a yeast out in the wild. And I think Avi explained this really well in the episode he said like you know discovering new yeasts is the discovery phase right it's like it's it's this broad you know 
if for people who are looking for the new and the novel and like trying to find something that's totally unique and different, right, that discovery is really important and that's really cool to see. Whereas, you know, the the genetic modifications are very targeted and especially when you're talking about CRISPR, if you're in, if that's what you're defining as genetically engineered is just like targeted removal or addition or upregulating or downregulating of a gene that very targeted uh, change like sour vicier for example or like the thialized strains from omega those very targeted chains that's all it does right you're not changing any other part of the genome and back to nick harris's comment from episode 20 it's like they know exactly what that change is going to do and they know that that change isn't going to affect anything else for the yeast cell right the yeast cell is going to operate totally like it normally would it's just going to spit out a little bit of lactic acid or it's going to spit out more of that beta lactic is releasing thiols, um, you know, so it's very targeted versus this discovery. And then I think about also this imperial, like imperialis um, st- strains or like the Nova Lager, right? These are hybridizations. So these are forced sexual reproduction by yeast in a lab. And so Avi made a great point on that as well which was at what point are those genetically engineered or genetically modified? Because yeah, those yeast might have become, you know, it's a natural process. <clears throat> so they might have become a, a, a evolved in nature, but holy moly, that is highly unlikely. You're talking about something that's like a one in a million chance or maybe one in 10 million or one in a billion or something chance that they, that this one specific yeast is going to evolve under these exact conditions to produce, you know, Capri or Mangostini or Nova Lager, right? Or hell, Here's a great example, uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus. (laughs) You know, I mean, that's kind of like one of those like, whoa, holy moly. The one of those one, uh, you know, one yeast crossed and then we've got now this whole strain of Saccharomyces pastorianus. But at what point are those hybridizations also genetically engineered and genetically modified? And that's where we get into the, the real fun discussion for me, especially with like a legal background is like, whoa, yeah, because they're sitting in in a lab and they're harvesting, you know, I mean, whenever they're, you know, trying to get these yeasts into sexual reproduction situations, there's billions of uh, millions of yeast that are on a plate that may be or may not be sexually reproducing and creating hybrids. Then you got to harvest those hybrids and then, you know, sift through them and and run, you know, some maybe some genomics on them to figure out if they even have brewing characteristics. Can they even consume maltose, right? And if they can't, then then you're not going to be able to brew with them very well. Um, And all of these different considerations and you narrow it down to like one or two out of millions uh, of these yeast strains. And so that really is human intervention at its finest. It's maybe not quite as fast as the targeted interaction. But I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that those like lab created hybrids, is that genetically engineered or genetically modified? Well, to a certain extent, it's just a semantics argument, right? It's whatever meaning. But that's what the law is. That's what it is. Right. (laughs) It's whatever meaning we ascribe to these specific set of words. And so um, I would defer to Miriam Webster's, right? Um, But we've been crossing plants and animals for years, you know, hundreds of years, we've been, you know, having these two things breeds like, you know, a a zebra and a donkey or a pear and an apple or something like that. And um, so I I, I think that society isn't as concerned about those things. Uh, But I think that there's a strong argument that, well, if that's okay, then why is GMOGE not okay? Right, exactly. And and I think, again, that was one of the arguments I think maybe Laura made, um, not an argument, but one of the comments that Laura made was like, we're targeting, it's such a specific thing that we're targeting when you're doing a genetic engineer, genetically modified. It's way different than like asking a, a donkey and a horse to mate together, create a mule, and then a mule that can reproduce and continue to, you know, do what it's supposed to do, right? Like making that happen is way harder to do than upregulating the beta lyase activity in you know a yeast i don't want to oversimplify because I, it's not that simple what they're doing at omega yeast if it was it, everybody would be doing it right but um 
But they're making very targeted, very specific modifications that they know what uh, is going to happen. But yeah, it, it is really interesting. And I love the semantics of this. Maybe my lawyer is showing. <laughs> uh, but there are some terms, right, that are important, uh, things that we need to talk about and that we talked about uh, in the episode. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back talking not only about terms like cisgenic or transgenic, genetically engineered versus genetic engineering, uh, but we'll also talk talk about Jordan and my experiences using GMOs, GMO yeast, and maybe we have a Christmas list of uh, some things that we would like to see uh, for GMO yeasts in the future. The new Brewbuilt X2 Unitank Conical Fermenter is here and it's ready to take your brewing game to the next level. With the best interior finish, welded and polished ferrules, clear bottom chamber, pressurizable with body connect fittings, etc., Brewbuilt has managed to bring commercial level features into the home brewing world at an unbeatable price. Now available with a professional grade glycol jacket, giving you a more sanitary environment and much greater cooling efficiency, say goodbye to clunky immersion coils with the game-changing jacketed X2. Visit morebeer.com to learn more. The whole debate about whether or not to use GMO or G ingredients or whether they should be regulated and all that stuff, that's for people way above my pay grade. But I, for one, am certainly enjoying seeing the diversity of products that are on the U.S. brewing market because of genetic engineering. Great examples are two of the yeast strains that we discussed on this podcast and we've already mentioned on the show, Sour Vissier and Omega's thialized yeast strains like Cosmic Punch, Lunar Crunch, or <laughs> Lunar Crush. Um, and Jordan, you have some experience with some of omegas thialized but if i remember correctly it's star party that you used right the the chico genetically engineered strain yeah yeah i love west coast ipa and uh was kind of like feeling a little left out with all of the hazy brewers getting to have all the fun with the thialized strains with cosmic punch uh and so when star party came out i was like the first one at the homebrew store to get it back um <laughs> and uh it works. It definitely works. Um, and so uh, I, I'm intrigued by the Lunar Crush one. That's a that's a lager one. Is that right? Uh, no. Lu- yeah, yeah, yeah. Lunar Crush is the lager one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I was thinking Cosmic Punch. Cosmic Punch is the, the ale one. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I just like this idea of I mean, it exposes how important the core yeast strain is, right? Um, a let, let's take it to an extreme example, like a Saison, right? A Saison ain't a Saison if you're using Chico. And so it just, it's really interesting to think about how these interact with each other, things like POF, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that it, it's really interesting to see how, what styles this whole thial thing works for. And now that I say it out loud, maybe a thialized Saison would be pretty good because a Nelson Saison is really nice. And that's part of the th- reason we like Nelson Savine is the thial the the unbound thial on it right mm-hmm. yeah 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 exactly i mean nelson Savin is one of those opposites like really high in free thiols uh so yeah exactly um you know um and and <laughs> i don't know maybe a saison with thiol sounds good <laughs> um uh but yeah you know but you've got these different types of yeast strains uh that are that do these very specific uh you know actions like re- like sour vissier producing lactic acid thialized strains uh releasing thiols that are bound um and creating really new and unique experiences uh but just before the break i teased some of the uh d- specific terms that we need to talk about right um um, and so this was a little uh, dense in the episode, but I think it is important because it, it's required for understanding like the regulatory issues here. Um, and so in the U.S., there's a distinction between genetically engineered um, you know, products and foods and those that aren't, right? Genetically engineered is the term um, that's important in the U.S. But elsewhere in the world and to some extent in the U.S. as well, the distinction matters more about not genetically engineering or like how if it was genetically engineered or not it's the cisgenic versus transgenic uh piece of it uh so that was really interesting to me that was something i didn't understand before the show and i hope that people understood it now but like cisgenic basically just means you're using genes from the same species um to make a modification so if you know that some yeast species have high beta lyase activity but chico for example doesn't you can add a gene from that species that yeast species into the chico 
Chico Yi strain and make Chico have high thiol expression character, right? So that's a cisgenic modification. It's it's a modification that's made inside of the same species. So uh, to clarify on that, would that mean that a Saison yeast uh, and a Chico would count as cis, even though they're like fundamentally different in terms of like the flavor or whatever? Absolutely. And that's a great example, right? If you wanted to give some Saison characteristics to Chico, totally. It's in inside of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that species. So a lager yeast, is that no longer uh, cis compared to Chico? Yeah. So I, this is where... So this is that's another question. That was a fascinating question. I wish I had thought of at the time to ask Laura because I think Laura would be the expert, or Avi um, also could probably answer that question. Um, but I th- I think that's a very very good question because is it? I mean, like Saccharomyces pistorianus, I arguably I would say is closer uh, to Chico maybe than than uh, a saison strain is, or you know a <laughs> Hefeweizen pop positive strain. <laughs> you know, right? Um, at least in terms of my preference or like what I what I use the yeast for and the things that I'm looking to get out of it but that's a fantastic question so if Saccharomyces pistorianus which is a relative right of Saccharomyces cerevisiae if you use uh, the sac the cold tolerance let's say from lager yeast and tried to put that into an ale yeast have you now created an organism that is subject to regulation right because now you've made a transgenic modification between species right and that's not even getting into the whole thing of of using you know a totally different plant but if you just focus on this and this is kind of where i talk about like i I jokingly said like the law is about semantics but it really is sometimes right like saccharomyces pistorianus using a gene from that and combining with saccharomyces cerevisiae to get a cold tolerant ale yeast right might be something that's subject to regulation but using and getting a clove or getting you know like you said saison flavor into chico might be okay and subject to no regulation this is where we're in this like even though it feels like you said we talked about this 20 years ago but we're in still in this weird gray legal space yeah it's like where's the line drawn so for example would we still be in the cis realm if we were crossing chico with philly sour which you mentioned is not a saccharomyces uh species to begin with yeah no i think i think that one's a more clear example right that one's definitely a different species of yeast where we're adding you know it's to, i'm sorry it's not even just a different species it's a different g- g- genera it's a different gen- genus of yeast totally different right um that'd be like maybe mixing like monkeys and humans the dna together or something <laughs> similar to that I, that may not be the exact reference but think of it that way as a gross oversimplification but yeah oh and then but like think about like you know 10 or 12 steps removed like the terpenes are with the with the berkeley yeast right they're using a, a totally different plant they're adding like i think it was basil if i remember correctly i, I can be uh, corrected but basil or oregano or something like that has terpenes in it and they added that into yeast so they're adding like a plant gene into a yeast so remember there's three kingdoms right there's fungus animals and plants um and then all the you know some of the protozoas and other things but at least that's what i was taught in elementary school you know 30 years ago <laughs> you know, but like, like that's mixing the kingdoms that's not even talking about like mammals mixing together you're taking like a, a plant and putting it into a fungus um you know totally mixing the kingdoms uh and so but that's what they did and, and again they can do that because they can see very specifically that yeast has this ability to make this exact terpene that a plant also can do even though they're totally unrelated organisms they have some things that they share in common so how does that work when they bring in the terpenes is the yeast um expressing terpenes or like converting starches into terpenes you know how that works yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it, it, it's the yeast is expressing the terpenes, right? So it, it's a pathway that the yeast uses. Um, and uh, there was a recent episode with Nick Harris. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head which episode it is, but it's the most recent episode with Nick Harris where we talked about terpenes um, and, and and getting terpenes into beer. So go check that out um, because he talks about it in there. But it's a process. It, it's um, There's biological processes that yeast use in order to metabolize or to make cell walls or to 
just kind of go about their daily business, right? Um, and essentially, by inserting a gene into the yeast genome, it takes that process and some of the metabolites that it's kicking off, instead of kicking off a uh, you know non-flavor active metabolite, it kicks off a terpene out of that same process. So it just changes, we modify that one thing and the byproduct of the process that the yeast doesn't need or anything that just gets jettisoned out of the cell, instead of it being aroma, you know, neutral, it's aroma active. Or at least that's my understanding. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as it can for a guy like a social right. scientist like me, not a uh, <laughs> biological scientist. Yeah. Um, so Kate, have you ever had a terpene infused beer? I have, yes. And this was uh, part of the sensory training that I've done to, before is to like, try to figure out like hot flavors. You can get some hop kits um, to talk, to take you through different hot flavors that come with like myrcene and humulene and geraniol and linalool and um, you know, uh, uh, some of the different like epoxides and, and oxides and, and things like that that uh, contribute to hop flavor. But I have, yeah. So like myrcene for me is like this just weird, really like grassy, like earthy, spicy character. Um, and just like really hop character. Like if I if I think about like oh man that that says like tastes like a hop. Um, it's mercine, mer- uh, but that's like a terpene at, uh, that that um, uh, I've had. There's a whole bunch of different terpenes though, and terpenes provide different flavors that people want. And so that's where Berkeley yeast kind of got their start is getting terpenes that people want into those beers. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. You know, they said in the episode of roses, a roses, a rose. I guess a terpene isn't a terpene isn't a terpene. Um, (laughs) But I had a terpene infused beer recently, and I don't know. I don't know if the can even said if they were adding like terpene extract or something, um, and uh, or if it was via yeast. And it was kind of like branded as like you know riffing on cannabis or something. So I don't know Mm, if they're using a hemp derived. Um, terpene or not. Oh, yeah. But but it was just kind of weird for me. And so I think that's one thing. That's maybe my uh, GMO hot take is can we just start taking things out that we don't want instead of adding all these weird things in that maybe we didn't need in the first place? Oh, man, that's a great idea, right? And maybe this is a good opportunity for us to talk about like our Christmas list of things we'd like to see um, in in uh, in beers. You know, I, I'm always thinking about things you want to add, but it's sometimes just as important to take things away, right? And and so that's a really good one is like, maybe there's some things I, I want to take away. I just want to take some of the terpene character down um, on this yeast. So instead of having to figure out like, okay, is Chico got more terpenes than juice is got more terpenes than, you know, whatever, trying to figure out like which strain, maybe you could produce a series that's like high terpene, medium terpene, low terpene. And then just like, here's the one that you want. Or, you know, even to like Nick Harris or Avi's, uh, 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 point is, maybe at some point there's going to be customized yeast strains like not just house strains but totally customized to your brewery what you want or maybe even to your brand um you know that you could com- you could partner with any of these companies like omega or berkeley or your lalamond or or you know any of the other yeast companies um and and make your own yeast strain that is just yours that's got exactly the characteristics that you want that's pretty cool to think about too that's really cool, but gosh, that's got to be expensive. You know, <laughs> breweries struggle enough. Just, you know, craft breweries will borrow 10 generation Chico from the brewery the next town over because <laughs> they don't want to buy a fresh pitch. I can't imagine um, the level of scale that it would require for a brewery to start investing in custom yeast strains. Oh, totally. Well, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, but there's a lot of breweries out there that might too, right? There's maybe some scale, but also things as they get more and more popular and people start using them more and more, the technology gets cheaper and cheaper, right? And so, you know, maybe as we start to learn more about which modifications can happen, we can be more specific about things. Like, for example, if um, you've already got the diacetyl free beer, or three strains like uh, like uh, Berkeley yeast has got, maybe adding a thialized component to that's pretty easy to do, right? So then now you've got a strain that's easy to build. And then you've got a strain that's, okay, we've got the diacetyl free. We've got the thiol. Now I want to add some terpene or maybe I want to take back some of the terpene. And so then you can like just start like iteratively customizing the yeast so the cost isn't as crazy high. But who knows? But I wanted, this is a good uh, segue. So there's a quote from goodbeerhunting.com um, and it was talking about GMO yeast. And I love this. This is what it says. It says, the year is 2030. Loggering is a thing of the past because diacetyl has been eradicated. 
Lambic takes three months, not three years to make. Most core beers are entirely unhopped, and kettle, sa- kettle sours are, not, are now called conical sours. Brewers are releasing fresh New England IPAs every three days, and lines still go around the block. <laughs> what do you think um, about that future of, of GMO yeast? Uh, I think we got a lot of work to do in six and a half years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Damn right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the like starting with the first one, you said lagering is a thing of the past because diastole has been eradicated. Now that we kind of have, right? We have this diastole free uh, lager strain, but surely something else happens during maturation in the lagering phase beyond, I mean, heck, you could... Uh, that's what diastoles are for, right? And so um, it, I think that that like just kind of exposes how a lot of these things we're trying to find shortcuts for. Maybe there's more going on than meets the eye than simply the one thing that we're isolating out of it. You know, there, it really some magic happens when loggers have sat cold for a month or so. You know, like it's 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 like it really opens up, and it's there's so much more to this than just diastole. I know, says the loggering purist. I know that's <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have you at Brewlosophy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but yeah, I mean, that's a very good point, right? And obviously, like diacetyl isn't the only thing. And you know, even Nova Lager, Nova Lager is uh, specially formulated to reduce sulfur, right? And um, and so that one uh, is also like a, a you know, I don't know if that's a necessarily a loggering characteristic, but it's certainly maturation, right? Get rid of some of the sulfur character. Um, it and, and so, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, there's other things to your point. That's exactly right. There are other things that are going on during lagering or during diacetyl rests that may be important to the beer. And as we start chipping away at these things, maybe we discover that we're making a worse product or maybe we discover that, hey, there's all these other things that we didn't realize were happening. Totally, totally. Um, yeah. And then the, the Nova Lager, you mentioned that. It, it, so it's reducing the sulfur content, right? Yeah. Now yeah. they're saying that you can also ferment it warmer and making a clean beer. Is that a function of sulfur in somehow? Um, I'm not sure. I, that would be a great question for Avi. I'd have to ask him that because I know he was involved with the production of that yeast. Um, you know, all I know is is that obviously sulfur is a big deal for lager yeast, right? Lager yeast produces a lot of sulfur, and so letting that maturation happen to get rid of some of that sulfur character is important. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's something to do with it. Um, at least certainly the timing for lagering. Yeah, I mean, but at a certain point, when we strip everything out, what's left, right? We have no diastole, we have no sulfur. Like, do we have malt character anymore? Do we have hop character anymore? Like, and you know, the the checks would be uh, run for the hills if they heard about this. You know, they want a little diastole <laughs> in their beer. We you got to find the sweet spot, and I don't think that adding every possible terpene or chemical uh, into the mix is the answer. Nor is stripping every single little thing out because we start to lose some of the magic that is the symbiotic relationship with all these chemicals that we've all been enjoying for millennia. Right. And, and then there was that other comment in there too, about like core, core beers are now entirely unhopped. Right. I, I think it's a long shot to think that we're actually going to totally replace hops again, because hops add more than just a one note character. Right. I, I mean, I think the the thing that they're talking about there is thiols from malt, right? That's a big deal. And we're going to have Cecile uh, Cheneau on the show again uh, to talk about thiols coming from malt. She talked about thiols from hops, but then now we'll get her back on to talk about thiols from malt. Um, but that is that is a thing, right? And there was a study that uh, Ricky Molitor did at Oregon State that I've talked about on the show before and had an episode with Ricky talking about, but it was using a yeast by Berkeley Yeast that uh, is a thiol-releasing um, yeast strain and he brewed beers where there were no hops added. There was like a, a, a flex bittering product. So that's just, you know, uh, iso alpha acids added in the boil and then no hops added to the beer uh, and and thiol and the, the beers rated really highly on overall hop aroma uh, because of these specific yeast strains. But that being said, big takeaway from that episode was the beer that was Whirlpool and I think and dry hopped or maybe just whirlpooled with whirlpool hops actually rated and tasted better um, the, for at least for me and Ricky. There was no like, you know, consumer panel or tasting uh, evidence that happened. But in discussing it with the panelists and with Ricky and myself, that one that had hops in it was better th- than the one that just had uh, yeast and no hops. So, you know, I mean, I think 
we got a long way to go um, in only six and a half years to get to 2030 um, in that way, like you said. But it's kind of cool to think about these things, right? Like, I mean, this is stuff that we wouldn't have thought about 10 years ago, right? Loggering is a thing of the past because of diacetyl. That wouldn't even have been a, like a, a thought process. Like, what are you talking about? Like, no, I'm, I'm not serving a beer that tastes like butter. People are just going to start liking butter. No. <laughs> right. Well, so what is on your wish list? If you could genetically modify Cade's strain, what characters would you like to add or remove so here's some things that i think would be interesting and these are kind of just in conversations that i've had with uh with brewers and chemists um and one of them that's gonna like personally impact me as well um because i'm gonna start doing a lot of research into smoke and smoke affected hops so wildfires are a big deal i mean right now as we're recording this there's a giant wild there are two giant wildfires in canada right that are affecting the eastern u.s and then also one that's affecting the northwestern u.s um so smoke affected hops and things and and uh, wildfires are going to be a uh, are some, a challenge in the future. Last year, I think there was something like 10 million um, hops uh, that were sequestered because of smoke taint, right? What if you could create a yeast that neutralizes that smoke character and wow. still ferments the beer, right? Yeah. What if you could do that? That'd be kind of cool, right? Um, similarly, non-alcohol and low alcohol beers, right? We're all in, we're in search of these beers that are, you know, maltose negative or unique yeast flavors and strains. But we can't get away from this fact that beer has fermentation character, right? It's not just alcohol, but there's other things. There's other secondary metabolites that give beer its characteristic flavor. What if you could just down-regulate the amount of alcohol that the yeast produces, but it still produces all of these flavors, right? Or what if you could ask yeast to take back up the alcohol and turn it into, you know, some other compound that's flavor neutral, right? What if, what if you could make a yeast ferment, get fermentation character, and then reduce the alcohol on its own? That'd be kind of interesting, right? Wow, yeah. And, you know, what about going the other direction? I'm not really into high-gravity beers, but yeast brewers you know yeast for beer tend to you know crap out about 15 percent or something on the high end of things uh you i know there's some strategies like constantly adding sugar or something like that but you run the risk of it being too hot uh not that the world needs a 30 percent beer but what if that was possible <laughs> yeah. that you could make a yeast that could uh tolerate that in a single fermentation without like staggered nutrient and sugar additions or something like that Totally. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I think about that would be really amazing um, if you could if you could do that, make a lot higher alcohol beers. Then you've got new styles that you can try, like not just barley wines, but even new styles. But then also, like if you're doing high gravity brewing, how easy would that be? Right. If you can make a yeast that's going to totally attenuate all the beers and we're not going to have to deal with that residual extract, then you can make uh, you could make a really high gravity brew, dilute it back to what you want. And then you've got a nice like light lager that you made, uh, you know, you've got. <laughs> tens of thousands, maybe a thousand barrels more of that beer because you were able to produce more e uh, ethanol out of the uh, out of the beer and still keep that fermentation character. Totally. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I guess theoretically Budweiser could do that right now and or, or Bud Miller Coors and make uh twelve percent and then dilute that down to four, but I think that they're more making it more like six or seven. So yeah, maybe there's yeah, yeah. a reason not to do that. Um but uh so you know, you said it ferments down, right? And so I think I was just talking about general uh breeding out or genetically modifying out alcohol tolerance, but what about attenuation without it being uh, diastaticus. And I don't know, it, maybe that's a semantics game at that point. I don't know. But uh, for example, I like a dried Pilsner and I use uh, an amylase to enzyme to actually help attenuate that, dry that out. Um, I'm not using a Saison strain just because it's a strong attenuator in a Pilsner. You know, that's not going to taste like Pilsner anymore. So could we genetically modify a yeast to make it a super attenuator without it being diastaticus? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I would think so. Yeah. Right. I mean, maybe that would be something that would be fairly easy to do. Make this yeast a super attenuator, but still have crisp, clean lager characteristics. Right. Like you said that you're not getting puff or something like that from some of those diastatic strains, which I think would also have a um, benefit for the low cal brewers. Right. Is mm -hmm. low calorie brews. They want those to be finishing, you know, zero Plato effectively or something like that. And so <laughs> yeah. maybe there are some low cal options in the GMO yeast world. Can we make it so that you could make a 
full strength, normal attenuation beer, like finishing at like three or four plate or whatever that uh, is low calorie via the GMO yeast. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I would wonder there too because you're going to get into like carbohydrates because it's got to go somewhere. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the the residual extract could be there. It's getting turned into ethanol for the most part, but who knows? I mean, maybe there's something that you could do there. I also love your earlier suggestion about like the fruited beers, right? I mean, we're adding all of these, you know, fruits and things like that into beer uh, to, you know, create like peach character or, or raspberry or, you know, uh, 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 orange or grapefruit or any of these things. What if you could, add, you know, make it where these yeast strains are contributing these fruit flavors? Like, what if they're getting rid of, you know, maybe producing the esters or the um, or the, you know, uh, thiols or whatever is created contributing to grapefruit flavor? What if you could have a grapefruit yeast? And that'd be kind of a cool thing. Like, here's, you know. Um, our yeast, I, like here's our Berkeley or Omega or Lalamond fruited strains of yeast where like put this yeast in and it's per- peach, put this yeast in and it's raspberry, put this yeast in and it's XYZ. That'd be kind of fun. What about vanilla? Oh, that's another good one too. Yeah. 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 Cause you know, and cause that's, uh, that's also one of those crazy things too, that like vanilla is actually a fermented, uh, uh, for fermented product. So like it's, you can, you can make, uh, vanilla using yeast. So that's, that's like imitation vanilla is made, not yeast itself, but it's made using a microorganism of some kind. That's really cool to think about. Like what if you took that gene and put that into yeast and then jumped up your pastry stouts? Exactly. And so for me personally, like I don't see a world in which a peach uh, infused yeast strain is going to ever replace fruiting on like four pounds per (laughs) gallon of peaches. It's just I just don't (laughs) see that being possible. And if anything, it might be more akin to like using a fruit puree that it's like it's not quite the same thing as as pure whole fruit, but it's still nice in its own way. Um, But certain things that are like really challenging, like coconut is notorious for spoiling and going rancid. I had a commercial beer that went rancid uh, that had coconut in it the other day, and it was like truly you could not swallow the first sip. And something like that or something like vanilla that's really expensive and maybe you just want like a little bit in the background of your stout and you're not like really trying to make it be the forefront Um, or maybe like a hazy IPA, a little bit of peach in the background that the sipper isn't saying that's peach, I'm eating a peach, but more it's like this extra little special spice that's in the background there that um, just enhances the beverage as opposed to trying to be the star of the show. Well, sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and this is where we get into that whole discussion like I was talking about with Ricky's experiment, right? Uh, but I think, you know, you, you say that, that there's not like a a, a yeast strain that, that it's unlikely that we'd have this yeast strain that would totally replace the peaches. I think I totally agree with you. But if a brewer, I mean, for a brewer adding in peaches, you're adding in a crap load of peaches and that's painful to add into the tank. It's, it's a lot of peaches. If you could reduce the amount of peaches by adding this yeast, that would totally be appropriate, right? Like, and totally be like, hey, yeah, now this is like a really nice peach beer, and I added a third of the amount of peaches that I normally add. Um, so yeah, it's totally have those opportunities for synergistics, you know. And then there's other things too, right? Like what hot flavors and stuff can we have in the future? And Another thing, I want to get back to the diacetyl because Berkeley yeast did create those diacetyl free strains. If there are problems that we're seeing in the brew house, there may be a yeast solution to to fix it. Like what about haze, right? Like if you don't want haze in your beer, what if you could create a a yeast that's going to excrete something or that's going to be like supercharged on its cell wall and just pick up like be like a giant magnet and just pick up everything as it flocculates out of solution take my money i want it right now (laughs) (laughs) right you're like yes i want a clear beer um you know but maybe something like that i mean the the sky's kind of the limit and we're just at the very very beginning of this which i think is super exciting yeah and obviously on the flip side too people uh, somehow somewhere people like hazy beer and uh, i gather it sells (laughs) really well but brewers really struggle to keep that haze in the commercial setting. I mean, any home brewer that's made a keg of Hefeweizen is disappointed when it's pouring perfectly clear in a couple weeks. It's incredible how difficult it is to get haze when you want it and how difficult it is to get clear beer uh, (laughs) when you want it. 
We can't yeah, win. To, to not have Hayes. Exactly. Yeah. And that was that whole episode also with Laura Burns. I mean, of course, the guest of this episode, they did all of that work on Hayes and they've now uh, got on their yeast strains, whether they're Hayes positive, negative or neutral. So I think there's totally opportunity here to say like, yeah, let's, you know, GMO some yeast to increase that Hayes or let's let's, you know, um, take some yeast use some of those negative traits to reduce haze um, in beer and make it a little bit easier to make clear beer. But the sky is kind of the limit um, in all of this stuff in terms of genetically engineered, genetically modified yeast. Of course, assuming that you're okay using them in the first place and that it's legal to use those in the country that you live in. Uh, But Jordan, all right, so I want to do a new thing on this episode. I always do this on the episodes where it's normal guests, but I figured it's high time that you and I should do this. I always ask, what's the one thing that you want brewers to take away from this episode, but you're a brewer. So what's the th- one thing that you took away from the episode on GMOs? Uh, they're not the boogeyman. And uh, there is a place and a time where they can do some really novel things. And I don't think that we should be afraid of them. And I think that we should be willing to give them a try. Maybe not every single one is going to be exactly what you're looking for. And that's okay. And so there's probably a GMO yeast out there that could really help you out in the brew house. And uh, it's worth taking a look at. I love it. GMO yeasts are not the boogeyman. All right. Well, that's fantastic. I think we did a great job of talking about GMO and GMO yeast. Uh, we also you know, covered some things that we talked about with the thial uh, stuff from last week with Cecile, Cecile Cheneau and Guillaume Willemart. Uh, uh, but next week, we're going to be back talking about harvesting yeast. So this is going to be kind of looking at those conventional methods. So I'll be back with the guests. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll be back with Jordan on our next Applying the Science episode. Jordan, anything else you want to add? Nope. Uh, I think we did it. And I'm really excited to see which of our wish lists they come up with next. I know exactly. And listeners, if you've got ideas of things that you want to see in yeasts, send them on and maybe I'll pass them along uh, to our guests. Uh, and until then, be sure to check out the Brilosophy Show, the Brilosophy Podcast, the Hop Chronicles, Short and Shoddy, Brew It Yourself Experiments, and everything else that we're up to over at Brewlosophy.com. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.